Welcome everybody to this um, very special session, um, this uh, briefing session, briefing meeting on the Council of Europe. I'm um, delighted that we're able to actually do it on Council of Europe, Europe Day, um, which is of course today, the 5th of May. Um, and we have as our speakers, um, three people who are intimately or have been intimately connected with the Council of Europe. Um, this is a subject we haven't covered very much in our faith in Europe deliberations over the years, but it's a very important um, moment for us to consider the significance and importance of the Council of Europe, which is often confused in many people's minds with um, the European Union and its associated <coughs> I'm absolutely delighted to um, welcome all the way from uh, Strasbourg in Alsace, um, Diane and John, um, Diane and John um, Murray, who um, are going to speak first. Um, and in fact, Diane is going to be um, our first speaker. Um, she uh, worked some 30 years for uh, the Council of Europe. Um, looking at equality between men and women in particular. Um, she was a librarian, she looked at sports questions. Um, and so I'm going to ask um, Diane to speak to us on the prehistory of the Council of Europe. Diane. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is going to be more the hors d'oeuvre or perhaps even the entree before John's piece of the resistance. Some years ago, we were having lunch in the Council of Europe in the posh blue restaurant with John Nurser, who was one of the driving forces in the setting up of this organization. And he shared with us his ideas and his visions for a movement of Christians concerned about the future of Europe. The Roman god Janus looks in both directions. And so for a very short time, I hope it might be useful for us to do the same and look back to what was one important launching pad for a united Europe. The International Congress of Europe held in The Hague in 1948. Looking at the outcome of this meeting could help us perhaps answer this perennial question of why are there two seemingly similar organizations, the Council of Europe and the European Union? They're often being mistaken for each other and technically they share the same flag and the same anthem. During the hype which accompanied Brexit, there was a great deal of consideration on the cost of membership, but virtually no mention of the one word peace or celebration of the fact that European unity had meant that for 70 years in Europe, when guns fired in anger had been silent. When considering the cost of European Union membership, no one seemed to make the comparison between the financial cost of war, how much it was costing to keep the army in Afghanistan, or the fact that the loans taken out to refinance the British economy after the crippling cost of World War II had only been finally repaid in full in 2015, just a year before the referendum of 2016. One ponders, is peace supposed to have no cost? Well, let's take a long step backwards when already in 1943, Churchill was addressing Parliament or in his speeches to the nation on how, once peace in Europe was achieved, how it could it be preserved. He spoke of the need for a European body that would bring reconciliation between France and Germany, two countries which had fought on three occasions between 1870 and 18, 1945. In his famous Zurich speech in 1946, Churchill repeated the sentiment saying, we must recreate the European family in a regional structure called, it may be, the United States of Europe. Shortly afterwards, a 
combined committee of the movements for European Union was set up and it ha had a membership of people from other organizations which were already supporting European Union, like the European Federalists. Initially, it broke the ground by organizing a huge publicity campaign to gain support for the concept of European unity. And then it went on to plan an International Congress of Europe to take place in The Hague, a city which was still half in ruins. It was possibly called a Congress to reflect the Congress of Vienna in 1815, which had tidied up Europe after the fall of Napoleon. The International Committee of the Movement for European Union went on to invite nearly 800 eminent figures from most West European countries, including Germany. There were politicians, members of parliament and ministers, of course, leaders of employers' organizations, people with military rank, trade unionists, journalists, lawyers and intellectuals, and even a few women. The British contingent consisted of about 100 people. Among those invited from the UK were Bertrand Russell, Lady Violet Bonham Carter, who was the vice chair of the United Europe Movement, Group Captain Leonard Cheshire, a former bo bomber pilot who had witnessed the atom bomb on Nagasaki. Miss Blyde, who's been once been the matron of King's College Hospital. Sir Adrian Bolt, the conductor of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Sir Hugh Bieber, the managing director of the Guinness Brewery, both a Catholic and an Anglican bishop. The poet laureate, poet laureate, John Maysfield, and several university students, including one whose name will be familiar to some of you, Noel Salter. Seventeen countries were represented, and observers from Eastern Europe and the USA also attended. The largest delegations came from France, Great Britain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy, and Germany and Winston Churchill was given the role of honorary chairman. This was an ambitious Congress, which set itself three objectives. To demonstrate that there was in all the free countries of Europe, a body of public opinion in support of the European Union. It was a good, thought to be a good thing. To discuss the challenges that kind, this kind of European Union would pose, and fight, try to find practical solutions to them and to give some new impetus to the international publicity campaign. The work of the Congress was divided up among three committees, an economic and a social committee, a political committee and a cultural committee. As the Congress pro progressed, two distinctive trends became apparent in the debates. The French, the Belgians, the Italians, the Dutch, and certain groups like trade unionists wanted a federal line to prevail. They wanted a closer, more inclusive relationship. On the other hand, the British and the Scandinavians were much more in favor of a looser European rapprochement. Why were there these two strains? Well, this is my own explanation. Those countries favoring closer ties had multiple land borders. They knew where there was somebody over the line. France borders on five other countries, as does Belgium. Countries which had endured occupation during the Second World War possibly were justified if they had the feeling that unity and an accompanying peace could only be as strong as any solid binding links. Then, to some ex then, as now, to some extent, even the scars of war take a long time to heal. France, where I have lived for two thirds of my life, had been the actual physical battleground for the three wars with Germany. Throughout the country as elsewhere, there are enduring visual reminders. In my own city of Strasbourg, one walks past a building with a discreet plaque saying, 
that the Gestapo occupied this building in the Second World War. In our Alsatian village, village people in their 60s and 70s, 70s will tell you that when young, they were forbidden to play with the children of certain other families because this family had supported the Germans during the occupation. Other families, however, will recount with pride that their family had included a passer, an ordinary brave person <clears throat> who guide, guided young men through the Vosges mountains over the border into France, where they could escape the draft, which would have forced them to serve in the German army and probably fight on the Russian front. Anyway, let's go back to the Congress. At the end of the Congress, when they made their reports, these three committees came out with some interesting suggestions, which will be actually quite familiar. The Economic and Social Committee called for the progressive abolition of trade barriers, for currency convertibility, for freedom of movement for labor, for the coordination of economic policies and the promotion of full employment. The political committee spent time discussing the creation of a European assembly, which would be elected by universal suffrage. And this is in a Europe where both where some countries either had not yet or had only just given the vote to women. It also argued for a united Europe open to Germany. The cultural committee called the adoption of a charter of fundamental rights a Supreme Court, and the creation of a European Centre for Children, Youth and Culture. When you take note of these recommendations of these reports, it's understandable why two routes to European unity opened up. Do you bring peace to Europe by making war impossible because economically countries are too intertwined? Or suppose they are so culturally close <clears throat> that they see the others as friends and neighbors and have been sharing their mutual problems without ever imposing their solutions, just strongly recommending them. Two ways or possibly one with two branches. The force of the guidelines laid down, the strength of the convictions of their advocates and the enthusiasm of the delegates led to the unanimous adoption of a political resolution which managed to contain all the recommendations from the committees. They were not legally binding, but they carried a lot of strength. Today, the Hague Convention is still important and their recommendations can be seen as texts which have helped to establish the Europe we know today. They remind us of the objectives of European integration and also illustrate any progress that has been made and encourage us to go on. Well, you probably know as well as I do what happened after the Congress. The statute founding the Council of Europe was signed in the following year, 1949, with 10 founder members. Greece, Turkey, and Germany joined very soon afterwards. Today, the Council has 220 conventions and agreements, and only signing one of them and ratifying one of them is oblig obligatory. That's the European Convention on Human Rights. The Schuman Declaration, which was a declaration made by the Foreign Minister of France in the following year, proposed a close economic tie suggesting that the European nations pull the raw materials needed to make munitions, notably iron and steel, and the European iron, steel and coal community came into being. It had six original members, and this eventually expanded, and it moved on, changing name, changing statute, changing conventions, until it became the European Union. Well, this has led to an enormous amount of legislation and a new discipline in law faculties known as European law. Thus, we have two seemingly par parallel routes to take forward the paths pointed out at the Congress of The Hague. Over time, the routes have sometimes converged, touched at certain points, steered mi miles away from each other. 
there's consultation and exchange of ideas. Near the end of his life, he died in 2000, Pierre Flimlin, a convinced European and at one time president of the Consultative Assembly, the Council of Europe said, the Congress of The Hague is surely one of the most remarkable events of the closing century. Until that moment, treaties of peace were signed following wars and were not worthy of their name. Imposed by the victors on the vanquished, they provoked more than anything else a need for revenge. At The Hague, it was no longer a question of preparing treaties, but rather of reuniting the people of Europe in a common organization capable of ensuring a lasting peace. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Diane, for that. Um, um, setting the scene, the cultural historical scene for us, and particularly the um, conflict between France and Germany, as you stand very much on the border uh, between those two countries where you live in your visit visitors at this time. Can I just say before I introduce John, um, that there is a chance to answer questions. If people um, who are listening into this uh, look at the bar right on the bottom, they will see a section called Q&A. They press on that, um, they can type in a question which um, will then um, uh, be answered by our panellists. So if you could um, uh, just draw your attention to that. Now can I introduce um, John uh, Murray to us. He retired in 2006 as head of the social policy at the Council of Europe. Um, we can see John on screen now changing seats with Diane. Um, he has been Anglican chaplain in Strasbourg and is an associate staff member of the Conference of European Churches, which of course um, we in Faith in Europe are very closely um, attached to and work very closely with. Uh, so John, many thanks for agreeing to speak to us and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, David. Um, so I'll be talking about the, um, uh, the looser, less federalist stream of um, European development since the war the two that Diane was talking about. Um, I start from a remark by uh, Theresa May shortly after Brexit, after the Brexit vote. She said, Britain is leaving the EU, but Britain is not leaving Europe. Yes, but I kept waiting for her to add, and in particular, we shall continue to be active members of the Council of Europe. But she never mentioned that. And in fact, very few people in Britain, uh, even I suspect in political circles, realize that the UK still belongs to a European political organization. And in particular, that the UK is still subject to the European Court of Human Rights. Well, first, a few basic facts about the Council of Europe. It was, as Diane said, established in 1949 by 10 states. Its seat is in Strasbourg to symbolize Franco-German reconciliation. It has now 47 member states and that covers um, virtually the whole of geographical Europe from Reykjavik to Vladivostok. Um, and the only areas that do not belong are Belarus, and Kosovo. But it's not just any and every European country that can join. There is an entry qualification. Member states must uphold human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Um, they are constantly trotted out as the three pillars of the Council of Europe. Uh, I think of them as the Holy Trinity of the Council of Europe, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Council is, uh, of course, active in many other areas than just human rights and democracy, but I think you can say the, 
the human rights ethos goes through all the works of the organization. There's work in legal cooperation, uh, minority rights, uh, racism, education, culture, social affairs, just a bit. That's the area I worked in. It's been rather run down since. Um, the only areas where the council does not really work at all are economic affairs and by statute defense. This is the only area actually that's ruled out by statute so that neutral countries could play a full role. It's a very wide range of topics on which the council touches with a very small budget and a staff of around about 2000 people. Now, the main differences between the Council of Europe and the European Union, which as was mentioned, are very often confused. And in fact, people tend to think Council of Europe is just one of the many EU bodies. Um, the Council of Europe is a classical intergovernmental organization. It's a bit like a United Nations for Europe. It's not supranational. It cannot legislate for its member states. It proceeds by discussion, recommendation, diplomatic pressure, but member states can and do voluntarily bind themselves by accepting Council of Europe legal conventions, which are international treaties. This um, voluntary sort of Europe should be the kind of Europe which the UK really likes. What are the main bodies that make up the Council of Europe main organs. Uh, the Committee of Ministers is the uh, governing body, meets once a year at foreign minister level. We'll be meeting in Germany on the 21st of May. Um, mostly it meets the level of ambassadors, permanent representatives, um, and they meet more or less every week. They're resident in Strasbourg. Each country has a small diplomatic staff. The current president then is Germany. And this, um, interestingly, perhaps, will be succeeded by Hungary on the 21st of May. The other principal organ is the Parliamentary Assembly, um, which uh, David Blackman will be talking more about. Uh, but the important thing about that is that it's made up of members of national parliaments, so members of the House of Commons and House of Lords to take part in its four annual meetings in Strasbourg. Um, it doesn't have a lot of formal power, but it's often referred to as the motor of the Council of Europe. Um, the MPs tend to pick up issues and, and press the diplomats to work on them. And sometimes one thinks that if the assembly wasn't there, the, the whole thing would just sort of gradually run down gently. There's also a Congress of local and regional authorities, and there's a Conference of International Non-Governmental Organizations. And among the many organizations that belong to that is the Conference of European Churches, and also several specialized Catholic NGOs. Um, the Holy See, by the way, being a state, is therefore not an NGO, but it has a permanent observer status with the Council of Europe, along with a few other non-member countries. Um, some of the NGOs also participate directly in the intergovernmental committees. For example, uh, Conference of European Churches is in the steering committees on education, on bioethics and human rights. Then there is, of course, the Court of Human Rights, which I'm going to say a bit more like about in a minute. And of course, the Secretary General of the organization. And the current Secretary General um, is the former Foreign Minister of Croatia, Maria Petsinovic, and the Deputy, Deputy Secretary General, Bjorn Berke, is Norwegian. I tend to think of three different periods in the life of the Council of Europe. First of all, uh, when it was just Western Europe, um, because of course the communist bloc couldn't join because they weren't multi-party democracies. Um, I joined it in 1973 and 
I think it did plenty of useful things, but it was frankly, you know, we were all a little bit relaxed and sleepy in those days. And then everything changed in 1989. We entered an exciting period. Most of the rest of Europe now wanted to join and over the subsequent years, they did join one by one. And they all at that stage wanted the Council of Europe to help them to become respectably democratic as soon as possible. So there was a great lot going on in that stage and you know, everybody wanted to know what the Council of Europe felt, thought they should do. Now, more recently, in recent years, we've come to what I would call the period of democratic backsliding. Um, one thinks immediately of member states like Russia, Turkey, but also Poland and Hungary, but others too um, seem more to be nibbling away at what were thought to be established principles of democracy and human rights freedom of press, terrorism legislation, COVID emergency legislation, and the growing reluctance to abide by the rulings of the court. I'll just give you a quote from the Secretary General in Athens last year. These, she said, are dangerous trends and their cumulative effect is a gradual erosion of the foundations on which post-war Europe was built. And one feels now really it's more a matter of defending the Council of Europe achievements than advancing further. Now a bit more about the European Convention on Human Rights and the court. This is of course by far the most important uh, achievement of the Council of Europe. The Convention on Human Rights, the most far reaching of all conventions was adopted in an amazingly short space of time in just one year, it was adopted in 1950. It's the only international human rights instrument with real teeth. It covers all the standard civil and political rights uh, inspired by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the UN, which was adopted in 1948, but it's much more binding. The key provisions are that it sets up a court of human rights, uh, that member states must undertake to implement the judgments of the court. That implementation is overseen rather rigorously by the committee of ministers. And there is what's called the right of individual petition. All persons present on the territory of member states, not only nationals, and all persons present legally or illegally can bring cases before the court. They have to first go through all the courts in the country concerned. But anyone, uh, if there is still uh, a case on grounds of human rights, uh, can then go to Strasbourg to the court. All member states must ratify the European Convention on Human Rights and accept the jurisdiction of the court. When the court finds a violation, of human rights, it often requires the state to, to pay compensation to the complainant. And in some cases, the state will be required also to change its laws and policies. And strangely enough, this usually happens. Sometimes after a considerable delay, during which the committee of ministers continues to apply pressure. To important cases from the past uh, from uh, affecting the UK uh, in the uh, during the troubles in Northern Ireland uh, there was the case against um, enhanced interrogation techniques used by the uh, British forces in, in Northern Ireland against terrorist suspects and several techniques were found by the court to go against article 3 preventing torture and inhuman treatment and so those had to be dropped. And then there was the case much more recently uh, that prisoners in UK prisons should have the right to vote and the British government didn't like that at all and eventually uh, gave in though on somewhat uh, narrow grounds, uh, prisoners can now be allowed to vote in some cases. 
there have been there are now lots and lots and lots of cases every year, hundreds of uh, thousands even. Um, many concerning migrants, uh, many uh, concerning um, discrimination, homophobia, you name it, but all sorts of things come before the court in Strasbourg. The problems of the Court of Human Rights um, are two essentially. First is that the system is a victim of its own success. There's a large backlog of cases because so many can come to the Council of Europe. Uh, the, a lot of work has been put into reducing the backlog. It's a bit better than it was, but um, you know it is a kind of massive buildup of cases. And then the other thing which I mentioned earlier on, growing reluctance by at least some countries to implement the more challenging judgments. It should be said here that the UK has a very good track record. It has a tradition, maybe not quite what it was, of taking international obligations seriously. Um, but of course, some high profile cases have caused Home Secretaries to object to powers of the court. The Human Rights Act, of course, introduced the Convention on Human Rights into British domestic law. Uh, it's very often criticised on the right politics in Britain. Uh, but the great thing about introducing the Convention into British domestic law was that it meant that not nearly so many cases needed to go to Strasbourg. So it was a way of avoiding international embarrassment because now many human rights issues can be dealt with in the British courts. Um, a lot of countries, uh, well, the countries who have the most judgments which they have not yet implemented, uh, well, number one is Russia, um, then Ukraine, Bulgaria, uh, Italy, usually to do with the slowness of justice, uh, Hungary, Moldova, Azerbaijan, and Poland. Those, those are countries with the largest number of cases, which are uh, violations which have not yet been responded to. Now, the, although the court's the most important area of work, there are all kinds of other things, and I don't have time to go into them, but I will just mention a few just to give you an idea. Alongside the court, there is a commissioner for human rights, um, currently a Bosnian, uh, Dunja Nijatovic. The commissioner is an independent authority who can make investigations wherever she wishes and publish whatever opinions she wishes about the human rights situation in member states. Um, and the important thing about that is the court, of course, only responds to uh, legal cases that are brought before it the commissioner is free to go anywhere and say whatever she thinks is appropriate. On the, in the area of economic and social rights, there is a, an instrument called the European Social Charter, which has a supervisory process, but I have to admit it, it's a lot weaker than the court process. There's also the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, and they can visit any establishment where people are deprived of their liberty um, and it can visit unannounced visits countries reports on them the reports are usually published and this has quite an influence countries don't like being criticized there's the venice commission for democracy through law that is a high level advisory body on constitutional law which had a, has had a lot of influence on uh, constitutional reform, especially in the countries of former Eastern Europe. Um, it recently gave an opinion on the amendments, recent amendments to the Russian constitution, a uh, pretty negative opinion, of course, on the whole. Among the more important conventions, the Istanbul Convention on Combating Violence Against Women, very much in the news at the moment. Um, the Convention on Action Against Trafficking, uh, a group of experts on money laundering, another group of states against corruption. All these systems have um, quite elaborate reporting systems and, and 
countries criticize one another and put pressure on one another to improve the situation. Uh, you know, it's all a matter of um, proceeding by recommendation and agreement, but diplomatic pressure does quite often have an effect on countries. Um, there's a lot of work, always has been a lot of work in the area of education and culture, and especially at the moment, education for human rights, education for democratic citizenship, and guarding against populism. Um, let me move on just to refer to some of the main challenges facing the Council of Europe uh, in present time. Um, well, Turkey was always a challenging member state, one of the first member states. Um, it's always been very keen to be considered European. Um, and so it's always been willing to just about keep within Council of Europe uh, requirements. But of course, the current regime is less open to Council of Europe pressure, but I think Turkey is still quite keen to stay in. Um, the biggest challenge, of course, is Russia. Um, can you call Russia a true democracy anymore? Um, it's constantly criticized by Council of Europe bodies. It doesn't like that at all. I think Russia attaches a degree of importance to continuing to belong to the body of respectable European countries, but it will refuse to be pushed too far. And that poses a real dilemma for the Council of Europe. You can't not criticize Russia, uh, but uh, for the, um, the power brokers in the Council of Europe, the, the weightiest states, one of the main reasons why the Council of Europe still matters is that Russia belongs to it. And it is a way of keeping Russia within the uh, European framework. Um, so it's difficult for the Council of Europe to go too far in its criticisms because then Russia will just walk out. Um, what uh, sanctions can the Council of Europe impose on recalcitrant member states? Well, they can be suspended from full participation um, and there is the nuclear option, they can be expelled. Um, now, what would it take for a country to be expelled? Here, another quote from the Secretary General. The reintroduction of the death penalty would be one red line. This is now taken as one of the Council of Europe's main achievements, no death penalty anywhere in Europe. And that is now more or less regarded as a qualification for membership. Um, Another red line would be the repeated unwillingness or refusal by a state to implement the judgments of the court. But we're a long way from any such drastic action. In practice, the main response to violation of Council of Europe principles is to offer assistance in uh, restoring the situation, in restoring uh, Council of Europe standards. Another ongoing permanent challenge to the Council of Europe is its relationship with the EU. The EU provides a lot of finance for some of the Council of Europe's projects. It finds the Council of Europe a convenient, cheap and reliable way of outsourcing work in non-EU European countries. But the trouble is the Council of Europe risks disappearing more and more under the shadow of its big brother. And if the EU expands its membership further, the Council of Europe will come to see seem increasingly unnecessary, except that it brings in Russia and Turkey, and we now have to add the UK. So, a final word about the UK and the Council of Europe. Non-EU member states those Council of Europe states which do not belong to the EU are usually the ones that are most interested in the Council of Europe because it's their only European forum. So after Brexit, the UK ambassador said, 
the UK places great value on the role of the Council of Europe in advancing work on open societies, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law across Europe. The Council of Europe has been and will continue to be important to the UK's human rights and foreign policy agenda. Our departure from the European Union will not diminish UK engagement with the Council of Europe. The UK is a leading player, founder member, and one of the five major financial contributors. The UK is committed to the European Convention on Human Rights and committed to improving the effectiveness of the court. End of quote. Um, all very positive, but I would say a bit low key. And indeed, you never hear politicians, ministers or MPs talking about the Council of Europe. Well, I'm open to correction. I hope I will be corrected. Maybe it's just as well during the present europhobic political climate that the Council of Europe goes on working largely under the radar. But as things settle down into the post-Brexit era, we should be urging politicians and officials to make full, fuller use of the UK membership of the Council of Europe to play a positive, constructive role in Strasbourg and, and even, even to be proud of this unthreatening European organization that it played such a big part in founding. The UK needs to realize that if it wants to keep Europe <coughs> democratic, it should make the most of the Council of Europe as a protective mechanism against sliding back into authoritarianism. We know where that got us in the 1930s, and that is precisely why the Council of Europe was set up in the first place, so that it would never happen again. Members of faith in Europe should, I think, be on the lookout for issues where it would be worth putting pressure on government to make fuller use of the possibilities offered by the Council of Europe. Many UK officials through the plethora of intergovernmental committees, MPs through the assembly and academics as speakers and consultants are actively involved in the work of the Council of Europe. This all needs to be mobilized and given a higher profile and groups like Faith in Europe can play a part in that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John, for that. Um, uh, can I first of all say how nice it is to see behind you, I guess, what are all your um, grandchildren's doodlings and drawings? <laughs> exactly. um, very nice backdrop, actually, uh, to, uh, to uh, a, a webinar. So, so thank you for what you've said. Um, and thank you particularly for that last challenge to face in Europe to identify issues. Um, which um, are within this sort of uh, ambience and context of, of, of the Council of Europe. Um, we are considering uh, where our future direction uh, lies, what our vision might be for the future, what issues um, might be the, the issues for the next generation, as it were. Um, um, uh, Faith in Europe began in 1961 with the um, East West Relations Advisory Committee of the British Council of Churches, where the main concerns of what were happening in uh, Eastern Germany, the GDR, and Czechoslovakia. Um, we've moved on an awful lot since then um, through the whole um, up and down of, of um, uh, ecumenical relations, through the rise and fall of, of, of communism, and through all the different uh, the issues of. Um, um, the European Union and Britain's relationship with it, but we have a new set of challenges and you opened that up for us, so many, many thanks to you for that. Let's move on now to our respondent, um, David Blackman, who um, uh, I'm very delighted to um, welcome to our special briefing. Uh, David is a member of the Faith in Europe Committee. Um, he's been much involved in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, um, looking at culture. He was head of the new European Parliament Division for Relations with East and Central Europe. Um, he's also active in the European movement, um, and particularly in the Oxford branch of that. 
um, and urging great attention to the Council of Europe, as you'll hear in, the min in a minute. Um, his faith connections, apart from um, uh, involvement with the faith in Europe, are he had a lot to do with the Strasbourg chaplaincy, and he was much inspired by the work of the late Barney Milligan and John Mercer, who many of you know have died quite recently. Um, he's also been involved in the Quaker Centre in Brussels and in the Diocese of Europe. So I welcome David to respond to Diane and to John, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've been looking forward to hearing from Diane, well, Diana's introduction, giving us the, the, the clear impression of the spirit of the 40s, the context of the founding of the council. Uh, and then John's twin experiences of Strasbourg as an official of the Council of Europe, and then no doubt in questions uh, on his role as Anglican chaplain in Strasbourg and as a staff member of, of Keck. Uh, I, as David has said, I was much involved with the chaplains in Strasbourg in the week, but I was hardly ever there at weekends. We had a the commuting life between Luxembourg and then Brussels and Strasbourg, uh, the caravan life as it was referred to, but it, I was very inspired by the work of Barney there and uh, John Nurser also, which means that I was one of those who was involved in cafe and then coming to faith in Europe. Uh, we've been trying to adjust to life outside the EU and some of us have been urging <clears throat> to an unresponsive audience, sadly, that we must take more account of the body we're still in. Uh, and I happily volunteered to be the discussant here because I'd been involved particularly with the Parliamentary Assembly and we'd agree I'd agreed with John that I would concentrate on that. Uh, it's a bit autobiographical, but I have to explain in the curious way which I popped up in various contexts. I'd been, I went to work for the socialist group after the original referendum of 75, encouraged by an old friend, John Roper. Uh, he was a Labour MP excluded from the Labour delegation that was just being sent to the European Parliament. He was regarded as too pro-European, but he was sent off to the Parliamentary Assembly where he was the whip, the key role then, because the Labour government didn't really have a majority. So he had to make sure that MPs were brought back from Strasbourg uh, for parliamentary votes, as this was true also of the European Parliament in its early days. Uh, he had a chance to do a big report uh, in, the, in fact, the Culture Committee, and I was I, as a consultant to the Parliamentary Assembly Culture Committee, suggested the subject. And the Roper Report of 70, 1978 on the protection of historic shipwrecks in international waters, finally, 30 years later, became an international convention uh, through UNESCO, which gave us both some satisfaction. And John had a special link with Strasbourg. His wife, Hope, was the daughter of John Edwards, MP, the first president, I think, of the Parliamentary Assembly, hence Allé John Edwards, the, the name of the main road leading to the council building. Uh, but uh, as an official of the Parliament, it, uh, people tended to find it odd when I appeared as a consultant of the culture committee but uh, we were very uh, I don't think it's realized how closely geographically uh, connected the two organizations are in Strasbourg the European Parliament uh, now has its own buildings but it didn't through the early days at all and I suddenly found myself dealing with the uh, work of the Assembly, uh, the, the European Parliament Socialist Group offered services for the 
socialist group of MPs in the parliamentary assembly, which had no staff. So we volunteered a couple of staff uh, to go during the sessions to Strasbourg. Uh, and uh, I was asked to take over because none of the non-British members of the, the so this group staff in the European Parliament, none of them could understand the splendid chairman of the group, Tom Irwin, who was a, uh, had a rather marvellous Geordie accent. But then later, that gave me, for some years, an insight into the work of the groups. There are five, and you can find all the details. Uh, then later, I became a parliamentary official, not working for the socialist group, but we set up in 1990 a group dealing with relations with Central and Eastern Europe. And I, speaking German and Russian, uh, was nominated to set this up. And I found going to the Parliamentary Assembly became tremendously interesting uh, because there were democratically elected MPs from the countries of Central and Europe and Eastern Europe after they had democratic elections. And staff from those countries joined the staff of the council and also of the parliamentary assembly. And so I then was asked to deal with relations at staff level, but also briefing the parliament president for regular meetings with the president of the assembly. And the two parliaments do keep in touch at committee level and the European parliament in fact, address the recent plenary session of the Parliamentary Assembly. You, and you can find all the details of their debates online. They're currently meeting in hybrid form, which is obviously saving a lot of trouble. For example, in January, they debated COVID vaccines with the Director General of the World Health Organization. And in recently in April, they debated the Alexei Navalny, anti-democratic procedures in Turkey and the fact that Turkey has withdrawn very oddly from the Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women. And they have, the Assembly is very active on having monitoring committees, for example, on the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And they had a debate on the situation in Belarus. They did go more closely towards an economic affairs in debating the OECD action plan against fiscal fraud. And as John has said, uh, there is a, a rotating presidency of the uh, Council of Europe and the foreign minister or his deputy uh, reports to meetings of the parliamentary assembly. And I have one vivid memory I happened to be able to get into the chamber when Helmut Kohl as Chancellor spoke in the plenary very impressively. He spoke about his youth as a young man in the Palatinate, formally and demonstratingly uh, going down to the frontier and breaking down the frontier between Germany and France. That was a, for me a moving experience. And as John has said, Germany is about to give up the presidency, its annual presidency. A Hungary takes over and we wait with some interest to see what the effect is. There are many areas of collaboration between the Parliamentary Assembly and the European Parliament uh, uh, on parliamentary research, parliamentary practice, and so forth. And in the 90s, which was the glory period, I think, for uh, the assembly in a sense that one had the new democracies of Eastern Europe and the International Institute for Democracy alongside the assembly and the parliament had training courses and introductory courses uh, for the staff and members of parliaments that were just emerging from being one party state. And, uh, and for example, uh, Richard Balf, then an MEP, uh, now involved in the assembly, uh, was represented for the parliament 
on various committees. And Terry Davis, rep MP, represented the Parliamentary Assembly until he was elected Secretary General of the Council by the Assembly. And this is the point I wanted to emphasize. There was a vigorous election contest uh, before he was elected. And I remember that the Russian vote was very uh, important at the time. But the, the role of the assembly in electing its own officials is obvious, but also some of the senior officials of the council and judges of the Court of Human Rights, obviously on national nominations. As we've made clear, the events of 8990 changed the face of Europe and the composition of the council and the assembly and subsequently of the EU, which I think tended to regard the council as a necessary staging place, uh, useful for vetting the democratic credentials of applicants for accession to the EU. Uh, and debates in plenary sessions of the assembly continue to concentrate on events within those countries, and particularly, as John has said, on Russia. Uh, the Russians, uh, found it rather irritating. I remember that their application for membership of the uh, council was dealt with by a pole and a check. <laughs> they spoke the language, of course, and that Polish official Wojciech Zawicki has just retired as Secretary General of the Assembly after 35 years service. He started as a director in 1996 after six years as Secretary General of the Polish Senate, which was revived by the Solid Danosh people in 1990. And uh, now, as we've said, Russia has been suspended from the assembly uh, recently over its annexation of Crimea. But, uh, and Richard Bauer, who I've mentioned, has quite, is quite an important figure here as a source for us. Uh, he pointed out that the Russian voice was was absent when they weren't able to take part in debates. Uh, but this, this, this infuriated the Ukrainians and they complained, their ambassador complained to the European Conservative group and Balf was expelled from the group. I, I have to declare some uh, interest here that I followed this matter. Um, I suspect uh, the main reason was that Richard Balfe had complained that the European Conservative Democratic Alliance Group uh, had expanded to include a lot of people on the far, MPs on the far right, uh, as it happened in the European Parliament uh, Group when the Conservative MEPs had left the European People's Party Group some years before, uh, and we are continuing. But this is something I can't develop now today, but we're raising this issue in the European movement, for example, because uh, the MP for Henley is one of the leaders of this expanded group, which we think includes people uh, on the far right. I've, as I've said, I, we must take more pay more attention to the council, and I've been actively urging this uh, in the European movement. Uh, there is a link between membership of the council and membership of the European Convention, and there are some in Britain who are saying we should leave the European Convention, but this would involve leaving also the uh, Council of Europe as a whole. Uh, and as, as Diana and John have made clear, Britain was very much involved in the foundation of the Council and, and the Convention. And there's still much confusion in Britain about the roles of Brussels and Strasbourg. Uh, people should have asked Strasbourg Convention. That must be something to, which we can get away from with Brexit. And the Brexit debate has rather overflowed its banks and that one detects here the strands of British, or is it rather English exceptionalism? I won't say much. Uh, David Thomas has mentioned uh, my involvement in going to the Strasbourg chaplaincy, uh, being involved in the 
development of the Quaker Centre in Brussels and being inspired by Barney Milligan and John Nurser. And also as an ordinary humble uh, member of the parish who's first in Luxembourg then in Brussels, uh, just at the time when the Diocese of Europe was developing, which I think was a two-way learning process, which may come up in questions. I close with two questions to John. I've warned him in advance. The first one is, and if David will allow me to introduce them there, and then they can come into the general discussion. What do you think, John, is, and Dan, is the place of ecumenical work in the Council of Europe? And secondly, more provocatively, uh, John, you had experience and Dan as council officials. Uh, looking at the role of the council, there are various aspects which must continue to interest us in the U UK, human rights, culture, education, and social policy. I wonder whether you feel that the EU with its feeling in the 80s, particularly of omnipotence or omnicompetence, do you think it rather trampled on subjects who should just have left to the Council of Europe? We're particularly concerned in the UK about our withdrawal from the Erasmus programme. If only this had been left to the Council of Europe, perhaps funded by the EU, then the UK could have remained a participant unless it withdrew from the Council of Europe a nasty prospect which we must do all we can to avoid. That is, it, I should mention that in, in, an important debate is this, at the moment is the Istanbul Convention, uh, where Turkey has withdraw, withdrawn from this, and there's big protest in Turkey, and this was a major debate in the assembly session of last month. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much indeed for that, for your uh, personal insights based on uh, um, a lifetime of experience of the Council of Europe and its uh, interrelationship with um, uh, particularly socialist politics uh, and also with the European Union. Um, and also your work as, a, as an archaeologist. I know you worked in, in Athens for some time. It's good that you introduced right at the end this uh, notion of Europe of uh, British exceptionalism as a narrative, and people might want to um, follow up on that. We have um, seven questions on the um, question and answer, but I think it's only right and proper um, that I ask um, John and Diane to respond to the two questions that David has asked of you. So I think you have a, a printed copy of one about the ecumenical work um, and one about um, human rights, culture, education, Erasmus program, etc. John, Diane, please. Shall I start? Yeah. Right. Um, I'll start then. Um, well, the place of ecumenical work in the Council of Europe. I did mention once or twice the uh, the role of the Conference of European Churches as a, um, a one of the NGOs and not just a participant in the Conference of NGOs, but uh, having in its own right observer status in three important intergovernmental committees. Um, one of the, uh, the problems is that the Conference of European Church, well, if the Council of Europe is um, extremely under-resourced for all the things it's supposed to do. The Conference of European Church is even, is even more under-resourced for all the um, mm. topics which churches would like it to be able to take up. Um, and I think um, in particular, uh, at the moment, um, you know, British churches have said, post-Brexit, we ought to get more involved in the Conference of European Churches. Um, and uh, what is lacking is um, a, uh, an executive staff member from Britain, uh, from one of the British churches. I think it would be, and, that, and that's a definite weakness in the Conference of European Churches set up at the moment. 
um, because I just you know do a few things in my spare time to help them. It's not not what's needed at all. Um, so um, there are also there are you know high level meetings between the committee of ministers and representatives of faiths, uh, rather like the Article 17, I think, uh, meetings in the EU. Um, although, you know, we have to respond to that possibility, it often seems to be a bit less interesting than the, the real substance work which goes on in intergovernmental committees. And if we can get, if we could get ecumenical bodies a bit more involved, or if they had a bit more resources to get involved, I think there's quite a lot that can be offered because church bodies, and I include the Holy See here, being, you know, essentially politically neutral, but strongly committed to the Holy Trinity of democracy, human rights, and rule of law, can speak with um, some um, authority and legitimacy. Um, and um, shall I? Um, no, I'd like to, to say add something. To yeah. the, um, the, the Council of Europe was established in France, and it was quite clear that until about, shall we say, 1990, it was a very French type organization. I mean, people spoke French rather than English. Or, and also, the, for example, it followed very quite strongly this idea of being a lay organization, not having particular interests in religion or taking up religious um, questions. And I mean, one of the things that changed, for example, in the 90s was that we got a prayer room in the Council of Europe. There had not, not been anything like that before, so that there was a prayer room for staff. It was made in a totally, um, uh, what's the word I want? Multi-faith multi atmosphere so that Muslim could use it or an Anglican could use it, or a Buddhist could use it, and it would there would be nothing to jar his or her sensibilities. So I think that that is quite important. And but it was with the beginnings of the really serious terrorism, which came from fundamentalist Muslims in Europe, that the Council of Europe really tended to take bigger in, interest in religious movements, all of them, and in the that they were happening in, in society. So I think, you know, this is in a way a fairly newish sort of field of activity, would you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, that's right. I think uh, the Council of Europe ignored religion until religion became a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, perhaps just moving on to David's second, second question. question. I mean, Yes, indeed. Uh, I think we who were in the Council of Europe always felt that uh, you know the EU was just moving into one subject after another, whether it really had competence in all those subjects. Um, but also, I would say that um, over time, the EU has been much of its work has been becoming more intergovernmental in nature, um, certainly in areas like social affairs. Um, and that makes a lot of its work rather more like the kind of thing the Council of Europe does. Um, so does it really make sense to um, develop some of those things in, in, in a smaller group of countries rather than in the whole of Europe? But anyway, um, so uh, I don't think there's a great deal we can do about that. Uh, the EU has the resources to do what it wants to do. Um, you mentioned Erasmus. I mean, yes, in, in theory, why not do something like that through the Council of Europe? As you say, the, of course, it's a very big program. It's a lot of money. It's a lot bigger than most Council of Europe programs. In theory, well, sometimes expensive things can be done under what they call a partial agreement, where a certain number of countries would say, we really want to do this, and we're prepared to put extra money into it. I suppose, in theory, they could have done an Erasmus on that sort of basis, but, you know, it, it didn't happen. On the other hand, it was the Council of Europe that first started the programme to find um, equivalence between the uh, D 
degrees and, and university courses and things like this in different countries, which I mean, to some extent, has been something that Erasmus has needed to take um, account of. Um, the other thing, when John sort of, we, we in sport, the count, the, um, counts, the EU did not have sport in its charter, it is now has been put in, but before it did, it gave an enormous amount of money to the Council of Europe to run a big Congress on sport. I mean, when you saw it, I worked in the sports department at that point, the money that was given was something like about an eighth or ninth of our annual, um, our annual budget, just for one activity, which was about a four day meeting. Um, so, you know, it, they just do have an enormous amount of money. I think about 10 years ago, one estimated that the Council of Europe's budget was equipped, the annual budget was equivalent to what the EU spent between breakfast and lunch of a morning. So, I mean, it really, really, one of the things that people could push for is an increase in budget, in the budget from the UK or from all of them actually. But um, it, it's, it's, would be like that. And one thing that was very, very um, heartwarming was that when we set up the Sprint program, we set up a lot of programs to help Eastern Europe, Eastern and Central Europe catch up, so to speak, of the 40 years where they had, in a way, been out of touch with Western culture, sometimes for the better. Um, that countries willingly gave uh, to help this. And when the, these countries joined the EU, somehow now that you were expecting a sort of little, oh, and thank you so much to the countries that helped us in our programs, but um, not a word, never mind. Diane, did, you've been doing a bit on the Istanbul Convention. Oh yes, Convention. the Istanbul Convention. Um, I've been working on the Istanbul Convention basically for the dioceses of Europe. Now, basically, the, is the um, Turkey ratified the convention, I think, in 2014, which meant that in 2017, they had a monitoring group came to Turkey and looked at how they were managing with the convention. Well. They had the report that went back had 300 over three, 340 odd remarks, which said, we would urge the Turkish government to do this. We would urge the Turkish government to do that. Um, it, John was saying that the British government didn't much enjoy being criticized. Well, neither does the Turkish government. And it's, it's a really, really difficult situation. For example, when I was in Turkey on a mission in the 1990 with equality between women and men, the English newspaper there happens to report that in Turkey, 90% of all men felt that they had a right to beat their wives. Um, this latest report in 2017 says, well, the percentage has gone down to 70% now, but there's an enormous way to go. I feel that somehow or another, instead of monitoring, it would have been, before monitoring, it would have been so much better to have some kind of facility for an education program or a, a widespread education and publicity program that could help countries um, either change their attitudes or change their law um, rather than just they're supposed to change their law before they sign the convention sometimes they do sometimes they don't um, but this is it's, it's not just good enough to have a monitoring system afterwards and say you haven't done this and you haven't done that and we would urge you to do this so anyway those are my thoughts on the Istanbul um, we have uh, 10 questions that have come in um, and because they're all, um, I can only see three or four at a time, I'm going to um, ask them, uh, I'm going to ask them fairly brief answers, if I may. Um, I'm going to answer them in the order in which they came in. So uh, the first one is from an anonymous attendee, 
and it says this, has Europe really had silent guns for 70 years? I think of the troubles UK earned, uh, bark separatism and encroachments in Ukraine. Other violence against the state continues with many concerns around terrorism. Is it a false claim to success? Um, in part, yes, but I would say that the ones in Ireland were a civil war in a sense. Um, in the Ukraine, yes, that, that is true. Um, but, and the Basque again, it, it's, the, the, it doesn't include wars that take place between countries. I mean, in Ge you could have talked about um, Georgia and things. Yes, so it, it is part, well, it's, it is, a, but there has not been a major, major outbreak. Thank you. Anything to add, John, David? Uh, well, just to mention that um, when you have <clears throat> this kind of uh, violent conflict or even war, um, there is another human rights mechanism that comes into play because there I referred to individuals bringing cases to the court in Strasbourg, but there's also a mechanism for interstate cases. And so Ukraine has brought a case against Russia. Um, uh, I think the, um, the Northern Ireland interrogation techniques was an interstate case, was it by Ireland against the UK. Um, so when you get these really major things, um, one country may bring a human rights case. Now that obviously doesn't bring a war to an end and uh, a court is really not uh, equipped to, um, to, to, to end military conflict. But um, nonetheless, it, again, you know, it does have some influence and causes major embarrassment. Thank you very much. Now I have a question from Keith Jenkins. Are you aware of any steps which the Council of Europe has taken in response to the threats to human rights, democracy and the rule of law in Hungary and Poland? I, I know that the Parliamentary Assembly has spoken out and I think David might help to add a bit about that. Um, and this is typical of the kind of case where um, for the diplomats in the Committee of Ministers, it's a bit too hot to handle and they will shy away a bit uh, that the assembly will pass resolutions and say, look here, you know, this is not good enough. Something has to be done. Um, and there, there are, of course, various Council of Europe bodies, but notably the Venice Commission on Constitutional Law that gives opinions on, um, say, developments in Hungary and Poland. Um, there are only opinions, of course. Um, but uh, David, would you like to add something about the, um, the Assembly on uh, these issues? Well, yes, they. They had, it was interesting, they had in, I think it was in the, the last session, uh, there was a resolution about, or maybe it was January, on the independence of judges in Poland, which has become a really hot issue in Poland. And there, this caused a split in the European Conservative Democratic Alliance group, because some right-wing members of that group from Poland took one line and I think the British Conservatives and others didn't know quite what to do, but this is the sort of illustration one has of that problem. On Hungary, we have the question that Hungary takes over the presidency of the Council of Europe later this month. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what problems that creates. It's similar, the EU has the same problem. Uh, with uh, uh, the, the two countries, Poland and Hungary. I, I speak with the motion having been much involved in the early 90s in visiting those countries and encouraging parliamentary democratic procedures and the rest to see the situation in those countries. 
this is clearly <clears throat> going to be uh, an area of battles in Strasbourg, but also very, very interesting to see uh, what, what in fact the, the debates are. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Harold Walker. Are serious efforts being made to beat back the erosion of standards described? Who wants to go first? John? Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose I'm not in touch with the Council of Europe in a sufficiently day-to-day -day way these days to know exactly what is happening. Um, I mean, there will be, um, I mean, the, the best thing is that there, there will be human rights cases um, against Hungary and Poland, for example. Uh, but of course, all that takes quite a long time before it feeds through uh, to uh, the Committee of Ministers. And, you know, then Hungary and Poland will be in a difficult position of trying to justify themselves. Um, as I was saying, the, I mean, you can, they can spin the process out for a long time, um, but, and they can, uh, if, they, if they have judgments of the court of human rights against them, they are supposedly bound to implement them. And the Committee of Ministers will see if they do but that can take years. Um, I mean, I think the, th the point is about an organization like the Council of Europe is it can't force countries to do anything, um, but it can maintain the pressure, make it uncomfortable for countries like, for example, Hungary and Poland at the moment. Um, and what quite often happens is uh, you know, in, in some time from now, perhaps the government changes. Um, changes which the Council of Europe has been pressing for for many years. You may have to wait a long time and before that happens, but it, in a way the Council of Europe is a place which won't let the issue go away. David, anything to add to that? Diane, anything to, to add say, to that? The Parliamentary Assembly can be more freewheeling and there can be some lively debates there. And it can form, we get our British members to be active. We're also conscious that it's not helped if their own government uh, appears to be ignoring international treaties. And that will be clearly used in debate, but it's a perfectly fair debating point. But I think we need more input from Britain into the Council of Europe debates and also back from there to the UK. Thank you. Um, we now have a question from Bob Fife uh, from CTBI. And Bob's question is this, if Scotland gains independence and Ireland is reunited, and then he puts in brackets, or indeed, if England is declared <laughs> independence, I want to say to Bob, what about the Welsh? Because I'm Welsh. Mm -hmm. uh, I.e., there is no longer a United Kingdom. Would each of the four nations be able to reapply and be sure of membership? <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice grenade. Yes, I, I'm just trying to think yes when when yugoslavia collapsed you know yes, fell apart yes they, they all had to reapply didn't yes, they yes and then they and they all got in they all got um membership eventually that's right serbia croatia slovenia bosnia is a member i don't because of kosovo's in a difficult position sort of halfway in halfway out so i suppose so yes um, Bulgaria. Because yes. I mean, I've often asked myself the question, what would happen if Britain was not a member and was now applying, which now applicant mm -hmm. state? There would be quite a lot of criticisms, I think, um, 
I think they would find the House of Lords extraordinary. I think they would um, uh, definitely um, be very critical of the lack of separation of powers between judiciary and the executive. And uh, uh, there might well be conditions for re-entry. <coughs> That's if I could just add on that, when we did these uh, parliamentary practice programmes explaining for the new MPs and staff in the Central Eastern European parliaments, uh, Britain was rarely a good model. Uh, actually, the EU wasn't either, but Britain's, the lack of separation of powers, I hadn't realised until then, the fact that your chief law officer was in a political government uh, was something you've uh, found very odd. But uh, one hopes that, that all these things are, are, are two way, there is a two way influence. One is conscious uh, when having to explain different political system that we think are democratic uh, to the such audiences. Thank you. And, and by the way, I could imagine the Council of Europe would say it's not acceptable not to have a not to have a written constitution. That's a very interesting question. Very interesting. Can we move on to a, a specific um, uh, area um, which you did allude to? Um, it's a question from Dorothy Knight who knows Belarus extremely well. And she asks, can the Council of Europe help the non-member Belarus at this dreadful time? Um, I, I, I've actually um, been to Belarus twice or three times. Um, at the beginning, in the early 90s, we were um, quite involved with Belarus, the women's part of the Council of Europe. And um, we were trying very hard to help them establish, for example, NGOs, independent NGOs. And they, I know that they did establish independent NGOs in human rights. Um, the, Count, the International Conference of NGOs actually invited delegations from Belarus in about the early years of the 2000, 2006, something like this, who came and sort of talked and sort of were, were very encouraged, I think, to, to with the welcome. And there are members from the Belarusian parliament who did go to into the parliamentary assembly, who were invited into the parliamentary assembly. I really don't know what's happening at present, but um, David may know whether they're still moving there. But um, well, apart from inviting them in and showing them, you know, what is happening in, in the Council of Europe and, and how eventually, if they had democratic elections, they could become, think about becoming members. It's very, very hard, I should think, isn't it? I mean, possibly other people know a great deal more about, apart from what one reads in the newspaper at present, one doesn't seem to learn a great deal about what goes on there. David, any, any, anything to add on Belarus? Yes, I think I think Belarus uh, they had a sort of uh, associate membership of the assembly for a time, but I think that was then suspended. Um, there are various statuses that the assembly has given to potential applicants, uh, basically for educational purposes, you know, influencing. But I think Belarus had it, but doesn't now. I'm sorry, I'm not that closely involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, a question from Richard Seaboam, another um, uh, Faith in Europe committee member. Um, and Richard asks, you might have mentioned the Quaker Council for European Affairs, which has been an active NGO yeah. participant. In the UK, some of us want to revive a former Quaker committee on truth and integrity in public affairs. Does the Council of Europe get into corruption, asked Richard. 
I don't know anything it, yeah. about corruption. corruption. It does definitely does get into corruption. Um, it's one of the things I passed over because I didn't really have time. Um, there's a body called Greco, G-E-R-C-O, the Group of States Against Corruption, uh, which is actually wider than the Council of Europe. It's the Council of Europe, uh, well, it's 50 member states. It's just slightly more than the Council of Europe. It includes, interestingly enough, the USA. And it aims to strengthen anti-corruption activities um, by mutual evaluation and peer pressure um, with reference to Council of Europe legal instruments. So it, it, corruption is indeed quite, a, quite an important area of work in the legal affairs setting. Um, and as for the Quaker involvement more generally, I think you know, Diane you know quite a bit about QCEA and its involvement with the Council of Europe. Well, yes, because QCA couldn't always send. I worked with QCA as a volunteer for about four or five years. Um, and as they couldn't always send people to Strasbourg for the international um, NGO meeting, I sometimes represent. <clears throat> but, um, you know, sometimes some of it, it wasn't really, um, it wasn't particular interest of it. I mean, it was interesting for, um, QCA to be involved with other NGOs, but I don't think there was a vast amount of um, material that overlapped. I think that they probably get much more from the EU than they did from us because, um, anyway, thank you. Can, can I briefly? Yes, please, please. Uh, uh, I did mention, I had to be brief, uh, I was involved in the early days of setting up the Quaker century in Brussels. Uh, and it, <clears throat> you can't spend your life and you don't have the funds to be trotting up and down uh, the line from Brussels to Strasbourg. That may be part of the point. Uh, some of us in the parliament spent our lives doing it. When I was doing, following both parliaments, I once or twice as my wife slightly sourly commented, spent up to 15 working weeks uh, in Strasbourg. Um, <clears throat> the QCA concentrated and was very influential, I think, in getting uh, a greater outside involvement and influence in the Brussels organisations. I think it's done a very good job there. I would suspect, although, uh, that we don't want to be indiscreet, that um, it influenced the diocese in, uh, in Europe, the Anglican diocese, in taking a higher, quotes, political profile in Brussels, which it has done now. I think the QCA, and I did mention it, has uh, played an important role, particularly in Brussels. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, well, let's move on. Can I and, and... just come back for that? I'm sorry. Yes, certainly, Diane. Yes, certainly. Well, one important thing was that QCA really pushed for the arrangement for an improvement in prison conditions for women, and they got a, they got um a, they got something through the both the Council of Europe and the European Parliament on this subject. Yeah. So, under so that that was a very important more place. Because I mean, the this was not an area in which the EU worked, so it was a very worthwhile project. Thank you. We've got three or four um, more questions. Um, one really uh, slightly follows on from the previous one, and it's a question from Judith Mason: Is there a UN United Nations equivalent um, to the Council of Europe? And what is the financial cost of the Council of Europe? You mentioned it has um, a limited budget in relation to um, the European Union and its institutions and associated bodies. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Give us some figures, perhaps? Um, yes, I think uh, the total annual budget is something like 330 million euros. And uh, I've often seen it described as being, you know, just like 
the budget of a medium-sized city. Um, so it's, uh, it's peanuts, really. Um, the trouble is that it comes, uh, the national contributions come from the budgets of foreign ministries and foreign ministries don't have big budgets. They don't have big programs. So they're always uh, trying to pare down their contribution to the Council of Europe. Um, and also, the, of course, the other big, very big difference with the EU is that the Council of Europe doesn't have any own resources. And the, you know, the, the EU just receives lots of money uh, from, from, um, uh, from, from member states. Um, so it, you know, it has tax income, part of VAT and so on. So um, it's really impossible to compare the way... Attempt, that attempt me, John, sorry, into a supplementary question. If um, foreign ministries aren't really contributing, do they rate to the Council of Europe? Do they use the Council of Europe? Um, well, yes, I mean, they, they do because, you know, they're, um, I think, you know, most of the member states and most of the foreign ministries regard the Council of Europe as a good thing and quite useful uh, as long as it doesn't cost too much. And yeah. I would just like to add that, you know, on that big red bus that toured the country before Brexit, Wrote, uh, it was inscribed that three the count the British UK alone sent three hundred and sixty five million pounds to the EU every week. So I mean three hundred and sixty five million pounds from one country compared with three hundred and thirty million euros for a whole year's budget. Um, it gives you some picture of how the two organisations are financed. Thank you. There's another part to do this question, though. Is there a UN uh, equivalent, she asks? Um, I mean, I, I just think, you know, the Council of Europe is a bit like a mini UN for Europe. Um, very, very mini, but um, it's a body to which um, all European countries aspire to belong. Um, nearly all do. Um, it um, has a whole range of programs uh, in many different areas and lots and lots of sub bodies. I mean, it, 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 it has the same kind of financing as the UN does. Um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, is there a UN equivalent of the Council of Europe? Um, I suppose the equivalent of the human rights work of the Council of Europe is the Human Rights Council of the UN. Uh, and the equivalent of the European Convention on Human Rights is the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, in both cases, I, I mean, the difference is that as the Council of Europe is a, an association of essentially, they call themselves like-minded states and you know, by and large, they are like-minded. Um, that is not the case of the UN, and where there are enormous ideological differences um, and not the same sharing of values. That's why Council of Europe human rights instruments go a lot further, have a lot more powers than UN ones. Thank you. I think I want to move on with the questions. Though. We've got three or four more come in. Um, one from a, a fellow Welshman, Gethin Rees, asks, does involvement in the Council of Europe depend on working through a pan-European organisation? Um, and he puts in brackets such as Keck for churches. Or could an organisation in the UK contribute its expertise to some aspect of the work directly? In terms of NGOs, um, you have to be an international NGO to be part of. Um, however, um, any 
uh, body of, of, of people, pressure group, whatever, uh, that has something useful to contribute, may be taken on as a consultant, for example, uh, may be invited to speak in conferences. So it's, um, you know, if, um, if you have something you feel could be um, a useful contribution, get to know the um, relevant officials in Strasbourg, and if they think this could be useful, you know, you can end up being invited to speak or to contribute to paper or something. So, so there are these more informal ways of contributing as well. Thank you. Anything else to add at all, Diane, David? Okay, uh, another question from Keith Jenkins. Um, it's worth mentioning that the um, Conference of European Churches, Keck, is one of a limited number of NGOs with the right to bring complaints about breaches of the European Social Charter and has in fact successfully brought a complaint against the, the Dutch government on behalf of the Dutch churches. Um, sorry, I can't see the end of the question because it's got tied, tied up somewhere. On the middle of the page. Could we have, could we have the question back again, please? Because yes, I'm just right. trying to get it. My computer right. is on behalf not of wanting to stop on Keith's question. Yes. Yes, I, I've got it, yeah. I, I'll, I'll repeat the question again. I've got it in full now in the middle of my screen. It's worth mentioning that the Conference of the European Churches is one of the limited number of NGOs with the right to bring complaints about breaches of the European Social Charter and has in fact successfully brought a complaint against the Dutch government on behalf of the Dutch churches. It's mainly a, a point that Keith's making, but is, is, there any, is there anything that you want to add to that? No, we remember this um, in the time of Richard Fisher with this keck. So I remember when this, this took place, yes. Um, I mean, I, I passed much too quickly over the European Social Charter in my talk. Um, and it, um, the main uh, control system of the European Social Charter is national reports. Um, I wouldn't say that's a very strong control, though they are then examined by independent experts and recommendations are sent and so on. But there is also this collective complaint procedure, which only a small number of countries have accepted. Uh, one of them is the Netherlands. Um, and uh, the way that works, it's not, not complaints by individuals like under the Convention of Human Rights. It's a limited number of um, NGOs, such as trade union organizations, uh, but also the Conference of European Churches, which have been given the right to bring collective complaints. Now, it's such a time-consuming and expensive matter that Keck uh, has only done that once, um, and most of the work was done by the Dutch churches themselves, uh, using Keck essentially as a, uh, as a sort of uh, way of getting in. Um, but it, 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 it was done and it did indeed result in the finding of a violation and that led to quite a rumpus in the Dutch parliament right? and some measures were taken. Um, and so I think for those countries, I know it includes the Dutch and France, and a few others where collective complaints are possible, um, churches in those countries could work through the Keck to, um, to bring things before the um, um, social charter. And uh, I think that's certainly, if Keck had a little more staff, it could really try and develop <laughs> that. But it's, you know, it's a quite a heavy procedure. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on quickly now. There's um, a, a question. It's, it's nice to hear from you, um, Damien, from Brussels. And what Damien says is this. It's a pleasure to join you all again today, following your kind invitation to speak in January. This is the Faith in Europe meeting in January. I would like to thank John, David 
and Diane for their expert historical and practitioner perspective on the Council of Europe and its assembly. And Diane for all her support for the diocese in Europe on the Istanbul Convention in the, in the Council of Europe. It's an ongoing priority for us, as you can see on our diocese in Europe um, media, and a topic on which Anglicans among Conference of European Churches members are well positioned to advocate as part of our Anglican, hang mm. on, yeah, as part of our Anglican communion effort. Thank you, and I look forward to staying in touch with Faith in Europe. Good wishes to all, Damien. So it's not really a question, it's just uh, an appreciation of um, all that you've contributed to the afternoon. So thank you very much for that. We have a question, we've got three or four more questions from an anonymous attendee. Has there been much engagement with Pentecostal groupings across Europe? Many diaspora expressions, as well as indigenous groups, exist in most nations, but I see little evidence of them in faith in Europe and in Keck. I guess that they are not therefore politically engaged in the Council of Europe, should they be changed or challenged, I think the question is. Pentecostal groups. Well, this is at least um, a question that Keck is very aware of. Uh, that the ecclesial landscape in Europe has changed a lot and in particular uh, Pentecostal groups often associated with immig immigration, not that I know it's always, um, have become a major part of the landscape and are not involved in ecumenical organisations on the whole. Um, partly because they don't want to be and partly because, you know, the, the right kind of relationships have not been built up. It hasn't been seen as a priority. I think Keck does now see it as a priority to build relationships uh, with Pentecostal churches and groups. Um, we're probably, um, I mean, it, it's also, as I say, a question of whether Pentecostalists want to be organized, uh, involved with the Council of Europe. If they, you know, if there is, is a serious desire to be involved. Um, it's a matter of creating uh, an international representative body that could be an NGO. That's perfectly possible, of course. Anything more to add, Diane, David? No, not for me. Okay, now a question from Charles Whitmore. There is an increasingly diverse legal, political and social landscape for human rights across the UK. Both Wales and Scotland are actively exploring ways to strengthen their respective human rights landscape post-Brexit. And these conversations are of course live in Northern Ireland as well. This stands in quite stark contrast to the UK government's consultation to reform the Human Rights Act. And the narrat narrative some high profile political figures promoted about leaving the council. He goes on, the call to action we have heard here for us to help stimulate further engagement with the council post-Brexit is I think very welcome. But what does this look like at the devolved level? Is there a space for specifically devolved engagement in the work of the council, maybe for NGOs in the devolved nation? There's an awful lot in that question. Um, over to you. I mean, this is clearly an area where, um, you know, the problem with the UK is that um, the English part and the other parts are moving apart um, in the sense that at least those in power in England are very cool about human rights. The other parts of the UK are um, wanted to strengthen it, which is... Um, you know, just one example of this divergence, which is putting strain on the union. Um, can the devolved governments get involved? Um, not directly. Uh, certainly, you know, 
lawyers, legal professors, NGOs in the devolved countries, devolved nations, uh, there is no reason why they don't get involved. And again, I think it a lot of it often depends on making the right contacts among officialdom in Strasbourg. Mm. Yes. Um, any further thoughts, Diane, David? No. no. We've, we've got to persuade our MPs of every tendency to to remember we're still in the Council of Europe. I mean, that would be my final message. They don't think about it. The SNP has particular priorities this week, etc. But medium long term, we need to get our elected members and our members of our delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly to take up these issues. The problem is the government party, uh, most people, uh, effective politicians are in government uh, or at least trying to survive uh, and uh, I happen to be in one of the other parties and trying to persuade the Labour M M MPs to really take this seriously now not just uh, in the context of an election and the whole question of the devolved uh, governments and the devolved parliaments these are major issues to raise, quite how the Council of Europe would respond to uh, organisations in the devolved states of the, Europe, of the United Kingdom is a good question. But this is, this is the world the United Kingdom is in now. And we're still in the, European, in the Council of Europe, and I hope we've got to stay there, but we have to watch this tendency to say, ah, we must get out of everything to do with Strasbourg as well as Brussels. This is quite serious. Thank you, David. Now, we're coming towards uh, the end of our session. We've got three or four minutes to go. Um, the final three uh, contributions are, in fact, um, a, a factual contributions from Sarah Dodson. Um, uh, three different quotes. She says, first of all, Factual correction to the UK contribution figure just quoted is based on the theoretical contribution of 18.9 million per annum. And then she adds actual contributions since 1984 was 13.9 billion. And the third observation she makes is therefore the weekly contribution just quoted was not accurate. Now, I don't know what um, uh, John and Diane and David um, want to say about that. Um, a challenge to the figures that you've offered. No, I'm very prepared David. to be corrected on the figures. I mean, she means, does she mean the contributions to the Council of Europe or contributions to the EU? I'm just don't, Council, which, which, Council which, 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 which um, one. Hang on, she's raised her hand, and I'm, I'm see if I can do yes. a I can get hold of her. Does she mean it? Which one does she mean? To? Hang on, I, I, yes. Oh, oh dear. Hang on a minute. Yes. Uh, she. Are we referring to the figure on the side of a bus, which nobody takes seriously? Uh, referring to the finger on the side of the bus, which nobody did right. Fine. Fine. Yes, I don't know what she's referring to. Um, and, and then she has one question at the end. Does the European Council have a view on the increasing threat of statelessness? Final question on statelessness. The Council of Europe is certainly against statelessness. I'm just trying to remember. Um, I, I, there's a relevant convention, but I, I can't remember. Um, does it have a view on the current increasing? I mean, certainly, um, I think member states are required to take all measures to avoid statelessness. So there are presumably means of pressure which ought to be brought to bear if state, in cases where statelessness seems to be growing. And there's also, um, uh, there are things in 
the un on in conventions on children, I mean, not just the UK one, yeah. about no child, every child should have a, have a country to which they belong, it should be born in, the, you know, the country should give their citizenship or their step to babies born in their country. Thank you very much. Can I say on behalf of everybody who's uh, listened into this um, webinar, a very big thanks to Diane, uh, to John, and to David for uh, giving us a very um, profound insight into the work of uh, an institution that we perhaps haven't given as much credence to in Basin Europe over the years. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, can I also say a very big thank you to the Ecumenical Forum for European Christian Women for the service, the lovely uh, service we had for Council of Europe Day a little bit earlier. Um, and I'd be very grateful if um, Dorothy could uh, pass on our thanks to uh, her colleagues who, um, with her help, put on that service. And, and finally, thanks to um, CTBI and particularly to Romina um for all the technical assistance um with today um we really do value this um enormously um, because we have a generation which probably isn't as techy as it ought to be uh, but we certainly couldn't have done this without ctbi and particularly without romina um, and it was very interesting to see the text um the transcription at the bottom of the screen which i hope was um, helpful to some of the participants today. Um, and finally, um, it was very good to hear uh, the names of one or two people whom I hadn't heard for quite some time. I think Diane mentioned right at the beginning, Noel Salter. I don't know whether Diane knew, but Elizabeth Salter um, was well known to a number of us. She um, was on the committee of EURAC when I joined it. She was a vice president for the British um, uh, Council of Churches. I'm extremely grateful to her because she provided her holiday home in Tenerife for um, my, um, my, my wife's honeymoon. So good to hear mention of Elizabeth and to think of the contribution that, that Neil, uh, that Noel had towards the founding of um, Faith in Europe in the sense that he inaugurated uh, Europe, which was the first of the ecumenical bodies um, from which um, Faith in Europe came. My only, my closest um, uh, physical um, um, uh, um, relationship with, with the Council of Europe was um, on, a, on a boat um, in Strasbourg um, uh, on a day trip and seeing a wonderful building. I'm very grateful indeed for um, you fleshing out what actually goes on in that building. And can I say on behalf of all the participants today, our grateful thanks to all you've given, all three of you have given um, of your life and work in the Council of Europe. I'm going to close the meeting now, but with very grateful thanks to, to all of you um, for what you said uh, and contributed to this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.